the question that I'm asking today is why are we here? Why are you here today? And each one obviously has a different answer. The provincial told me to come or whatever. <laughs> but why are you here? And that's the question I'm asking throughout this brief presentation. And in order to do so, I'd like us to make it personal. To go back to the event of our baptism, each one of us, just think back. Now, some of us with white, well, none of us should remember our baptism unless you were an adult uh, baptized. But think back of what happened at that ceremony. And this is the foundation of why we are here. At the beginning of the baptismal ceremony, the presider traces the sign of the cross on the forehead of the person being baptized and says, the Christian community welcomes you with great joy. In its name, I claim you for Christ our Savior by the sign of the cross. And I now trace the cross on your forehead. I claim you for Christ the Savior. And then, after the baptism, there is the anointing with chrism, with these words. And each one of us received this. The God of power and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has freed you from sin, given you a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and welcomed you into his holy people. He now anoints you with the chrism of salvation. So each of us is anointed, indelibly anointed. And then we receive the white robe. You have become a new creation and have clothed yourself in Christ. See in this white garment the outward sign of your Christian dignity. And each of us, it's good to meditate on that. This is what happened to me. This is what I am. This is my dignity. And that's why I'm here today. Because I am baptized. And then we think of the Eucharist. That each time that we have received the Eucharist, we become one with Jesus, one with the body of Christ. We are absorbed into the life of the Trinity. That's our dignity, and that's why we are here today. When we were confirmed, each one of us heard the bishop saying our name, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, sealed, indelibly sealed. And that's why I'm here today. And for those of you who are married, that covenant of love that you entered into in the sacrament of marriage, that's why you are here today, because of that sacrament. And those of us who are ordained, through that gift of ordination, through the sacrament of orders, we have been given a mission. We have been transformed into something that, into an instrument of God for the people of God. Each of us with our different vocation. So that's the beginning. We are here because we have been chosen by God. We have the dignity of being Christian. And that's the foundation. Nothing else is more important than that, in being here. And then the second question that we ask is, okay, as baptized people, why are we connected with the oblates of Mary Immaculate? Why do we hang around with the oblates? And a lot of people will say, because we like what the Oblate Fathers are doing and want to help them. And I stress, I put in reverse commas there, the Oblate Fathers, because this is how we have come across in the last 200 years. So, we like the Oblate Mission, and, and a lot of people who belong to the Mazenodian family are there for that reason. We like the work that the Oblates do. And then, as baptized people, we need models of how to live our baptism. And that's the whole communion of the saints, these holy people, canonized and not canonized, who are our models, who teach us 
how to live our baptism, to teach us Christian discipleship. And for us, as members of the Mazenodian family, we have one saint in particular. We are attracted by Saint Eugene de Mazenod, by what he stood for, by what God did in him, what God did for him, and what God did through him for the world. And Eugene, when he felt his call to live his own baptism, looked at how did Jesus put, portray his own mission? And he took Luke chapter 4, where Jesus begins his public ministry by unrolling the scroll of the book of Isaiah and reading out to the people, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom from, for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. And then, Eugene, looking at the mission of Jesus, said, Our own mission is that. The same mission of the Son of God. And so he took as a motto for his own life initially, Evangelizare pauperibus misid me. He has sent me to evangelize, to bring the good news to the poor. And then others came to join him. And those others who came to join him formed this first Mazenodian family around Eugene de Mazenod to bring the good news to those poor people, to those abandoned people who were the victims of the French Revolution. And after 10 years of our existence as a private group, Eugene went to meet the Pope and to ask for approbation. And that moment where the Pope said, I like this congregation, I like what they stand for, I want it approved, the Pope had recognized, here is the hand of God. This work is not the work of Eugene de Mazenod, it is the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's why the 17th of February, which is the anniversary of that, is our important day for us where we realize we are here because God has brought this family about. And so for 200 years then, the missionary oblates of Mary Immaculate have gone to all the ends of the earth, to 66, 67 countries, to proclaim that salvation, to proclaim the greatness of Jesus the Savior. And then this picture that I have here, says something about our status. The Oblate Fathers went around bringing this tremendous treasure, this beautiful gift to those who were the most abandoned. And this painting was done for the beatification of Joseph Gerard. And ideally it is meant to be the people of Lesotho who are kneeling before the cross. But it's a picture that became very controversial from the very time that it was painted. Where people were saying, well look at the missionary up there and the people down there, yes they are receiving, but what does it say about our theology? And that was very much for nearly 200 years or a little bit less than that, that we have had Father, the Oblate Father, who brings the good news to people who accept it very gratefully. And then came the Second Vatican Council. And that changed the, the balance a little bit. And the very first action that came out was that constitution on the church. Lumen Gentium, the light of the church. And what comes out in this hierarchical, in this pyramid that we had of the Pope, the bishops, the priests, the religious, and then the laity down there praying and paying and obeying the whole thing gets overturned where Lumen Gentium speaks about no states of perfection but it speaks about the universal call to holiness. All of us who are baptized have an equal dignity. So the Oblate Fathers and the bishops and the religious etc. we have no greater dignity than our baptism. And so that was the first point that the Vatican Council stressed. No more pyramid, it's now a circle. 
And the second point that came out from the Vatican Council that affects us is the whole idea of going back to the roots, going back to our sources. And as religious, we were asked, as different religious congregations, go back to your roots. And discover in your roots something that the early church had. Charisms. Gifts of the Holy Spirit given to people, to groups of people, or given to an individual to build up the body of the church. And so within the circle of the universal call to holiness, the universal living out of our baptism and of that dignity that God has given us, we have people, we have groups with a particular gift of the Holy Spirit called a charism. And so we recognize then that that approval that the Pope gave to Eugene de Mazenod in 1826 was the recognition of a charism. And we who come into the touched by that charism. So, it's expressed then in our oblate rule in the first constitution, which is the one that summarizes what is the charism of Eugene de Mazenod. And it starts off with the call of Jesus Christ. Heard within the church through people's need for salvation draws us together as missionary oblates of Mary Immaculate. Jesus Christ calls us, he gives us that charism to respond to the needs of the church. And then how do we do it? Christ thus invites us to follow him and to share in his mission through word and work. That's how we live out our baptism according to that charism of Eugene. Cooperating with the Savior and imitating his example, we commit ourselves principally to evangelizing the poor. And that's the charism of St. Eugene de Mazenod, called by Jesus Christ to be the cooperators of the Savior, to allow the Savior to work in us and through us to bring the good news of salvation to those who are the most abandoned. And then we looked at this whole phenomenon that we have had over the years of lay people participating in our mission, initially receiving it, receiving the message and then saying, well, we'd like to help you, we'd like to cooperate with it. And we have this whole thing in the church of the idea of the associates of religious congregations which Dr. Bushlack spoke about last night. And so we look at Rule 37a, which summarizes what in 1982 was expressed, was recognized. The charism of St. Eugene de Mazenod is a gift of the Spirit to the Church, and it radiates throughout the world. Lay people recognize that they are called to share in the charism according to their state of life and to live it in ways that vary according to milieu and cultures. They share in the charism in a spirit of communion and reciprocity amongst themselves and with the oblates. In order to live more intensely the mission of evangelization according to the oblate charism, some lay people gather in associations. I think we need to tweak some of that vocabulary a little bit. This is the vocabulary of 1982, and we have been developing since then. So then we ask the question, what is the Mazenodian family with this whole background? And here in the United States province then, we, unite, we identified eight different groups of people who are connected with the charism in some way. But it was with the oblate charism at the center. So all these people gravitating around the oblate charism. 1995, the canonization of St. Eugene de Mazenod. And we see that picture there of the relic of St. Eugene being placed before Pope John Paul II. And at that moment, we lost as oblates the copyright to St. Eugene de Mazenod. 
he was proclaimed as a saint of the universal church. He doesn't belong to us anymore. He belongs to the church. And so that shift then came about with looking at the Mazenodian family. That no longer do we look at the oblates, the missionary oblates, the oblate fathers and brothers in the middle. But we have the charism of St. Eugene de Mazenod in the center. And this diagram that came out last year for the year of vocations, I think sums up for us this new shift. It is not the oblate in the center, it is the cross. It is Jesus the Savior with everyone around that cross. So we ask ourselves the question then, what is the purpose of the Mazenodian family? Why are we here? What is this Mazenodian family all about? And here we take again that first constitution that sums up the charism of St. Eugene, and I have tweaked it just a little bit to read, the call of Jesus Christ heard within the church through people's need for salvation draws us together as a family around St. Eugene de Mazenod. So the call of Jesus Christ draws us together through people's need for salvation in the church as a Mazenodian family. And we continue then. The Mazenodian family Christ thus invites the Mazenodian family to follow him and to share in his mission through word and work. That's why we are here. Cooperating with the Savior and imitating his example, we commit ourselves principally to evangelizing the poor. And so every single one of those facets of the Mazenodian family exists because of these points behind me. The call of Jesus Christ, heard within the church through people's need for salvation, invites us to live our baptism, our dignity, as cooperators of the Savior, to follow Him and to share His mission in word and in work. And we commit ourselves principally to evangelizing, to bringing the good news of salvation to the poor and to the most abandoned. And this brings me then to what this Congress is all about. We're not here to give you talks. We are here to listen to one another. The model that I have put up there of the Mazenodian family may not be the model that we want to use next week or next year. This is just the beginning. It's a working model. We've got to listen together. So what is the road ahead? for the Mazenodian family. I see a number of points. The first one is we need to clarify our identity as a Mazenodian family as a whole and then each of the component parts of that Mazenodian family expressed in terms in the language of the charism of Saint Eugene. <coughs> So it is about identity. Where do we fit in? And I've got the charism of St. Eugene and these different arrows showing different ways that in fact we now are living that charism. I'll say a little bit more this afternoon about that. <coughs> but the identity then is to look at each one of those eight groups and to say, well, what is my identity in the light of the charism? What is my relationship in the light of the charism? What is God calling me to do and to be in the Mazenodian family in this light? And so we have to identify, but the most important thing that we need to do is to listen to each other. And that's why we are here. We're going to be listening today and tomorrow. How do we see ourselves as fitting into this particular picture? And then we want to produce a directory that each group in the Mazenodian family, in the light of the charism, says this is what we are. This is what an honorary oblate is in terms of the charism. This is what a partner is. This is what the youth leaders are, etc. And we hope to have this by the convocation of 2020. So the first one then is identity. The second point is to develop a sense of being called to Mazenodian discipleship. 
I don't just come because I like the oblates. I like the work of the oblates. I want to help them. They're missioning in this place. I can help them through funds, through my professional help, whatever it is. But that we realize I am called. This is the way that I am living my baptism. And so the call of Jesus Christ, heard within the church through people's need for salvation, draws us together as a family around St. Eugene de Mazenod. We are called, we are drawn. And that's an important step that we have to take as members of the family. To help people to come to that realization, it is a vocation. The third point is ongoing formation in discipleship through the charism. To deepen our knowledge and our understanding. Christ thus invites us to follow him and to share in his mission through word and work. And we have to deepen that through study, through talking to each other, through what we propose as a Mazenodian family committee to have an annual theme for the whole family to live through, to have meetings, regular meetings, where we share our journey and our understanding of our vocation. To have resource material available, which is something that we've, we've started, it hasn't got terribly far this last month, but to provide material for each area, each group of the Mazenodian family to use, to enter into the theme of the year. And retreats, one day retreats, longer retreats. So, ongoing formation, which is important. Fourthly, to develop a sense of community within the Mazenodian family. That we are one big family. That we belong to one another. And I've quoted there from the charism of St. Eugene, as it is expressed in Constitution 3. The community of the apostles with Jesus is the model of our life. Our Lord grouped the twelve around him to be his companions and to be sent out as his messengers. The call and the presence of the Lord among us today bind us together in charity and obedience to create anew in our own lives the apostles' unity with him and their common mission in his spirit. The Jesus who calls us who is in our midst, and community as a Mazenodian family is to celebrate that and to allow that presence of the Lord to make us into community. And so that we have this interrelationship then as we participate in the mission of the Mazenodian family. And we had a, an example of this with the, the partners recently. We had um, Tijuana had a particular need. And so one of the partners said, okay, I will give $100,000 provided that others match that. Okay? And so it was matched. And a letter went out from Artie to tell people it has been matched. Thank you very much. And, I, and it's helping the Oblates in Tijuana. And immediately I had this Mazenodian family idea. I said, hang on, you're not just helping the Oblates. And I grabbed that email and said, reply to all. And I put in there, you are helping the Mazenodian family because it's not just the Oblate brothers and fathers that you're helping. But down there we have several branches of the Mazenodian family who are ministering together in Tijuana. And this is what I mean as an example of the Mazenodian family missioning together and sharing our time, our talents, our ideas, our prayers, whatever it is that we can do to bring about that mission of proclaiming the gospel to the most abandoned. Not to help the oblates, but that we're doing it together as a family. And the last point that I see is linked up with what Dr. Bushlack said last night, becoming oblate. Now, a number of years ago, if a girl came up, and this happened in Spain, and said, I want to be an oblate, they all said, bad luck, sweetheart, 
you have to be a boy to be an oblate, to be an oblate. And these girls insisted, and as a result of that, we have Las Oblatas, the, uh, this very dynamic young congregation of women oblates. So in those days, if you said, I want to be an oblate, it meant I'm going to be an oblate brother or priest. But if we, today, with the idea of the Mazenodian family, if we say, I want to become an oblate, it doesn't mean I'm going to become an oblate brother or priest. It means I am going to be a member of the Mazenodian family. And so we have the idea then of oblate and oblation. Now, for the Lustude, who is the one who's been pushing the Mazenodian family, insisted when we came to the eight groups, he said, I want the name oblate in every one of those titles. Now, I didn't really agree with him, but he is the provincial superior. <laughs> and so, it's one of the rare times that I obeyed him, but unwillingly. Yeah? Because for me, it should have been this. It should have been the Mazenodian oblates, and the Mazenodian youth, and the Mazenodian this, and the Mazenodian that. Okay, but anyway, I swallowed it all. And then, the man that I'm very privileged to be sharing this journey of the Mazenodian family with and Oblate Studies and Charism, David Munoz, said to me, I've had a eureka moment. Because he knew about my discomfort with this thing of the Oblate this, the Oblate that. And he says, excuse me, isn't oblation at the heart of our Charism? True. And Dr. Bushlack, as an as a Benedictine oblate, picked that up in, in talking about it last night. Oblation is what makes us Mazenodian family. And so therefore, Lou was actually very prophetic at that stage by saying, I want the word oblate in each one of those categories. I was the iconoclast, you were the prophet. And, and, and that makes sense. As we say, oblate partners, it's not partners of the missionary oblates of Mary Immaculate, but we are partners in the oblation of the Mazenodian charismatic family. And so why are we here? We are here in this Congress to try to answer something of those six questions, just to begin the journey. This is going to be a long journey. Uh, we don't know what it's going to look like as it develops. So I'll just sum up the six points again. To clarify our identity, to develop a sense of being called to Mazenodian discipleship, a sense of vocation, ongoing formation and discipleship through the charism, develop a sense of community within the Mazenodian family, participate in the mission of the Mazenodian family, and all of us become oblate. Thank you very much.